CW taking off the shirts. Well, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm trying to. I've been catching up. What What is the rules? You got to avoid cussing for 30 seconds, and then it's fair game. We can do anything now. Okay. Like literally, I can go back through and edit this. A lot of times, yeah. I'm going live and and shit like that. And I, I try not to edit because I don't like editing. And I and I'll never remember where it all is. But this one, I mean, I've got on like three different platforms right now, so I'm definitely have to go back through. But yeah, we can talk about anything you want to talk about and not talk about. You can cuss all you want. It doesn't matter. 30 seconds is going to be passed. Um, so yeah, anything you want, man. You can say whatever cool. you want. No, Whatever's good for right. not, not the words that would trigger somebody. Well, yeah, you can't say like. No, no triggering words. I got you it. You can't say offensive, you know, whatever. That's all I fucking say, though. You well, know that. Yeah, it's been. It's been how, do, how do you know if, if you're about to trigger someone or not without being that person? Yeah, it's more der- derogatory, I guess I should say. Yeah. The, the, the typical derogatory terms that... Well, that, I'm calling myself a lazy fat ass. Why well, that's okay. I you can say that. I think you can ass. say that. That's fine. <clears throat> Not, I'm up to date. I'm with it. I'm good. So, uh, you know, you're supposed to just tell him how, how great he was. So was that your first battle royal when you took... You were Ali G, though, the first battle royal, weren't you? Yeah, that was that was the first match, and Rip told me to go out there and fucking take my time and take off every every piece of jewelry one at a time and put them down in my pockets and then take off my chain and then get in and, and get fucking shit canned. <laughs> and uh, you pitched it to me ahead of time, and I think I pulled it off, and you just loved it. And, uh, God, that was, a, that was a nice way to start the business. See, I think that's where he's a little confused because then eventually you went to the, uh, the like, the three polos. Remember, you took – yeah, polo one off when you were in in the frat, and then had like a polo underneath it, and then you took that polo off, right? Well, well, on the Ali G thing, Rip, you you didn't know who Ali G was, correct? Right. No, that's what I was talking to him before we connected with you, talking about Ali G, and he said he had no idea. I said, remember, he painted the the gimmick on it. You painted the beard, right? The goatee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. You just knew it was a great gimmick. <clears throat> I just knew you was fantastic, greatest fucking ever. Yeah, Suzio, Suzio in particular hated that I got over with you because of that. He's like, you just fucking do an Ali G. What the yeah. fuck? <laughs> and, and Rip was putting me over every promo class. Like, it helped me with my promos, like, come out of my shell a little bit and get creative. That's what I was telling him. He, he says he doesn't remember the Ali G. He just remembers the, the beefy and the, and the, and the, uh, the polos. So the, the shit can on the Battle Royal wasn't the polos. It was all his Ali G gimmick he was taking okay. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my my second match, I think I had maybe three matches as Ali G because I didn't have any gear. I'm just kind of stupid about certain things. Like I I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and paid two thousand dollars to train with Joey Matthews and Riff Rogers, and I don't fucking get wrestling gear. So yeah. I I need I just needed something. So I'd been Ali G <laughs> for Halloween a couple of years in a row. Actually, that's how good it was. And uh, so my my first official match was a it was an eight man i don't remember a lot of it i know steven streetman was in there and probably uh like alaskan assassin somebody else but Assassin's i just remember <laughs> on the other side on the other side was von lilas oh nice i don't remember three other dudes but i just remember <laughs> i remember I, that i needed to, to pay my dues and and you let me know that you were going to be taking off my ali g shirt which was just a big baggy black shirt and you were gonna be giving me some chops now did i really tell you i was gonna do that or i just did yeah you did you did yeah, I, huh. yeah, I was a little surprised even then so i gave you the like maybe you because sometimes i would rip them so maybe i was just trying to be nice and and didn't want to rip your uh halloween costume or something <laughs> wait so so you told me that and i was i was pretty in my life is i'm pretty much embarrassed of everything that i do so I was doing the Ali G gimmick, but it was like a facade where I could not be me at all. And I could just be a character. And you told me you were going to rip off my shirt. And I was kind of nervous about that because I didn't want anyone knowing that I was doing this dipshit ass gimmick. So I asked you, if you would pull my shirt over my head so that I could put it back on and not lose my shirt. Because I didn't want anybody to see you know, as little of me as possible. You don't want to show off your body. Right. And I, I posed as something like, I don't want anybody to know I'm in shape. And, uh, <laughs> how'd that, how'd that go? How did, what I, what I say to that? Well, you gave me a look like you wanted to, 
chopped me. But uh, you said all right, and then and then uh, and then and then you did it in the match. You didn't you didn't destroy my shirt or anything. You just pulled it over my head. You lit me up a few times, and I was I was able to save what dignity I had and crawl back out of the ring. And that was my first thought. See, I am a nice guy, man. I got everybody always called me an asshole. I was a nice guy. Look at that. You just asked nicely. I would leave your <laughs> shirt on. I said, sure, man. Anything for you, buddy. You're a new guy here. Yeah, you guys, I, I I can do that for you. Put your shirt back down. I might have even tucked it in for you. Who knows? So point being, if if you wonder why the business is the way it is today, yeah, I think it started in that moment when you let me get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault. I love uh, it. Hey, I'll take <laughs> it, man. I was going to if I if I prepared for these kind of shows like I should, I've got a picture from that match somewhere. Somebody sent me a picture. I'll have to find it and send it to you. Somebody, it, we're outside of the ring, actually. I think it's from that match, or it might be a, a battle royal, but you're definitely Ali G. And we're either right on the outside of the ring or against the ropes, and I was either lighting you up or just got done. But it, it was a good picture of, of me and you, though. It was good. I, I do remember that my do-rag had come off, and I was embarrassed about that as well. It's fucking Dylan. <laughs> yeah, it was a while. So how, how long did that gimmick keep going? Before you it, it was probably it was probably about three weeks, and then I think Marty had come up with the with the with the frat gimmick, Fatal Amnesty. You remember Marty the in the control room? Oh, he came up with your right. gimmick. That was his baby, apparently. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. I so, no Streetman wanted us to be called something that that uh, came out to Cox, so it would spell Cox. Oh, so yeah. we could say Cox rule and do that gimmick, and, <laughs> and Marty Marty wanted Theta Lambda size so that it would so that it would say OBW. So we ended up as Theta Lambda size. So that's when I did the, the three polos, and I I learned from my allergy experience. To the more shit I had on, the more I had to take off. I guess that's wild. So t- so OBW was your first? Was it your first place you went, or DCW, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, that's that's. That's where I came. I decided I wanted to do it, and I did a little research, and it was there, and it was Atlanta. And then you picked OVW. So uh, do you remember who you talked to first? or, or I mean, you didn't start out. I'm trying to think at that time, Rip had DCW. Was was contract still there? Yeah, contract was there. So were you in the Rip beginner's was, class then? Rip, you, you were doing intermediate class, I believe. Yeah. Plug my computer right. in. Uh-huh. Yeah, probably at that time. Who was the beginner teacher? Oh, so uh, you guys had Tank on last night. Yeah. Yep. T- Tank was my very first teacher for like two weeks. Okay. Oh, really? H- him and Seth Skyfire. Oh, right. And uh, I-, I ran the ropes for the first time, and and I I have some athletic ability, I guess. So I, I ran them for the first time, and I thought I was going to fall out of the ring. But Tank looked at me and said, you ribbing me? You work before? <laughs> no. So Tank was there for two weeks, and then and then Joey Matthews took over the final probably ten weeks, I guess, okay. of the beginners class. You do all the uh, all the calisthenics and stuff, then, huh? God, he beat the shit out of us. Yeah, I remember we'd come in for like a show or whatever, like you know, back to Davis Arena, you know, to meet up to to leave or whatever. And I remember Joey had have you guys, or maybe you weren't in the class at the time, I don't know, but like out in the parking lot doing squats, <laughs> like running around the building or the parking lot or whatever. I was like, good Lord, man. Yeah, we do we do over a thousand squats in a given day. It'd be like 90 degrees outside, and he'd, ha- he'd have them outside doing all, all kinds of shit in the parking lot. Yeah, he'd, he'd have us there until you guys would show up after us, just, just to have us do another 500 squats in front of you. Oh, yeah. I bet we were coming to class probably, weren't we? Is that what it was? Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That was wild. I used to give him so much shit about that. He, he didn't, obviously, he didn't care. But well, he always thought, had a chip on his shoulder. And, and he, he would tell us, he said, you know, you might not be the biggest guy or you might not be able to cut the best promo, but no one's ever going to outwork you. I mean, I love Joey. I just gave him shit. I got to know him pretty well. So, he was kind of booking, you know, there when the contract left and we were doing all the, the, the house shows on the, on the weekends, whatever for OBW. So I got to know him pretty well. We'd ride with him to places and stuff like that. So I, I'd, I'd fuck with him. Um, he, we were, I feel like pretty cool or whatever. 
But um, he was one of those guys that wasn't the biggest for sure. But, man, he made shit look real. And he had that mentality that he was like a badass type of guy, man. Like he And he made everything look good. And he was convincing, that's for sure. You he intimidated the shit out of me. Really good. Yeah. Yeah, Joey, yeah. Was, he, he was good, man. I haven't talked to him for, for a long time. We used to keep in touch a little bit, but. Haven't uh, haven't seen him. I just remember one one show where he he started feuding with Blair. Remember uh, Blair Anthony Bravado? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started feuding with him, and I remember there was a show that Joey took a chair or uh, Bravado took a chair that Joey blocks it, wrestles it away from him, turns and hits him with it. He gets in the bag. I'm like, oh, real real nice, Joey. Like you just blocked it from a freaking stud bodybuilder took it from him hit him over the head way to put yourself over just giving him all kind of he fuck you he, he, didn't care. <laughs> he was awesome man i love this it was show. probably the six flag show is probably why he did it could have been so then uh you got in with you guys did the data land of Messiah. then you started doing what, what when did you finally ever get gear man i mean what took you so long to get gear i can't believe rip and those guys let you go so long without being a fucking wrestler and showing your body off and and doing well, all that. Hang on. Did, did, didn't you wear uh, baggy jeans for about five years or something? I didn't look like you, though. I, I mean, I had skinny legs. They're still skinny or lean legs, as, <laughs> as uh, Twinkle Toes used to say. I wore baggy uh, baggy pants. Yeah, I did for a while. I was a fucking school teacher. I, I wasn't beef Wellington, man. Like, yeah. Well, those, those little plaid shorts that I had, those are pretty small. So, yeah, that, that was actually that was a pretty good gimmick. I wished I'd try that one again at, uh, at FCW. <laughs> Did, did you ever take it there? Did you ever try it? You didn't try it at all? No, I did. I never tried gimmicks second times at any point. I, I wish I had it done that one. That was a lot of fun. So you and said we, you said in a text, you had, was that your only Von Lila story? The, uh, the, the, the shirt pull down story? Was that the story you were going to tell? Yeah, that was the, the kill in the business story. Yeah. Was, that was the, <laughs> the kill. <laughs> Killing the business. I remember we were at, I think it was uh, Charlestown. It was Indiana, somewhere in Southern Indiana. And me and, I think it was me and APOC in the, in the main event. And you wrestled Elijah Burke Pope. Yeah. The match before us. And you had gear at this time. You had the Carolina blue shit or whatever, looking good. Pope was looking good. You guys went out there, tore the house down. You in about 20 minutes or whatever. And uh, Elijah Burke comes through the curtain. He said, Follow that. And I said, we fucking can't follow. We only got five minutes left. You took all our fucking time. Thanks a lot. You remember that? Uh, yeah, I remember that vividly. Did I get a lot of heat for for getting in that spot? I don't. I mean, who are you going to get heat with? It was fucking me and APOC. And I don't, I don't know. I think Roadkill running the show or something. I mean, there was nobody really got heat, let's be honest, compared, you know, to other places. But, yeah, I was. I mean, I was – kind of pissed i told him to fuck off i mean i wasn't real happy about it yeah, he said he wanted to work with me for whatever reason and then he showed up late and then uh we went to a few things like right before i mean he was good yeah oh, it was a great match yeah i was not ready for that spot probably but no it was awesome man did you ever get to do anything with nick dinsmore when you were coming up through like at any of those amateur shows or anything? No, no. I remember. No, he, I, I never worked with Nick. No, I remember he was down there for a lot of them, and he would take a lot of guys that you know he would like that were new and green, and and work with them. He he did with me, and uh, I, I fucking loved it, man. So I didn't know if you ever got a chance to do that down there or not. No, he might not have liked me. I don't know. Maybe I bet that was probably it. <laughs> Just I got to work with Al Snow one time. He came in. Oh yeah, give and, us some. Uh, that was when... go ahead. Well, that was when that was when Lumpy was there. Lumpy's MIA, man. Nobody's seen Lumpy forever. You, you get you got the goods on Lumpy. You know where he's at, man. You know where I could find him. Let's expose no. him right now on, on live national TV. We're not really live, but could be. No, he just he made out with Serena on live TV, and then he just he dipped. That's all he needed. <laughs> That's all he needed. That's what he was there for. <laughs> He was like, it's never going to get any higher than this. This is it, right? No. He knew when to get out. He yeah, was he smarter was... than all of us. <laughs> and he you know he's doing well. He, he's a multimillionaire somewhere. Dude, I know Pops, Ben Hameen, look for him 
for a long time, put a bunch of stuff yeah. out there, and nobody, not one person had any kind of lead on him at all. God, he's just a, a leaf blown in the wind, huh? Disappeared. I remember at one of those amateur shows or whatever, um, I don't know. I don't think it was against you guys, but I was against Lumpy. It was another like eight man tag or whatever. And I, I think I pulled the shirt up or something and did the back rake. And he started bleeding from the ba- uh, back. And Danny Davis fucking chewed my ass. He was so pissed because I think it was a tape or TV match or something because mm-hmm. there was blood. It shouldn't have been blood. Oh, he was hot. Danny was so fucking hot. Did you have to go home? I don't think he sent me home. No, I was probably I, I probably drove Rip there, yeah. so I could. I, could I mean, really like leave. this was TV. I mean, I did, you had to you had to wrap the match. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Oh, go home that way. Yes. Oh, Danny, I've seen Danny actually send people home as well. So I thought that's what you were referring to. But yes, we did have to wrap up the match. Yeah. <laughs> and Danny was question pissed. for you. Yeah. Bleeding. Uh, so when I was the OVW heavyweight champion. A guy came in. His name was Michael Demos. I don't know if you remember this guy. He's a pretty big guy. So we had we had the dark main, and we had we we're gonna have a big match. And we went to lock up, and he he busted himself open on my on my knuckle. And he was he was he was cool about it. He didn't care at all. We went to the we had to we had to go home immediately. And then he went to the hospital, and got stitches. But I busted him open on the tie up. And so he kind of gives me shit about that every now and then. But my theory was that 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 that's on him. Can you can you give me a, a technical standpoint on whose fault it would be if you bust yourself open on a tile? I'll let Rip take over this one. Well, I've seen guys uh, hit heads, bump knees. Guys have hurt their knee, have to have surgery and shit. But I I never did that on a, a collar and elbow tie up. When your head's supposed to be the right, you're supposed to be left hand supposed to be around the neck. I don't have, I don't have to see that how that shit happened. Why do you think it was his fault? Well, I don't remember a thing, but I would assume that if you keep your your head up, that you're not going to bump into the guy's left fist. I I don't know how I would have reached him otherwise. Do you know why he said it was your fault? Well, because I it was my my fist. Because you punched him in the forehead. Yeah. It could be it. I don't know, man. I, I've never seen it happen before. I thought somebody would back me up. Someone with some technical prowess. <laughs> Riff Rogers. God damn it. I'll take that. I'll take the heat. After 15 okay. years, I'll take the heat. So far, I, I am the uh, I, I'm the reason that his career went s- s- sideways. And, and you won't back him up on the, on the blood spot, man. <laughs> Tell you what. Come on, Rip. Turn that thing off, man. Hey, um, when you went from then, how long were you in OVW doing after the contract left and you were uh, – did you go to As Beefy Wellington? After you left um, the Theta Lana Psy, you went to the gear and you were so low, right? You were the champ for a while. How long did you go until you got signed and take us through getting signed? I wasn't there then. I had the face thing all messed up, I think, at that time, and I think I'd left. So, so you wait you hang on you did you have butt bell's palsy yeah mm-hmm. damn I, I had that before i ever wrestled and it lasted for like six months and it went away yeah mine never really went away i think it was actually we had a ladder match me and apoc had a ladder match and it it, it came the next day and, and people never really say how you can get it you know i've google looked all the shit but i just remember i took a shot and it wasn't even with the ladder it was with his his fist in my ear that I, I kept telling him that he broke my ear, like my ear just was killing me. And then I get to the show. We we're in Elizabethtown and power was like, uh, what kind of drugs are you on? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you looked all fucked up. And, and I said, I, he said, go to the bathroom and look at yourself. I went to the bathroom It was 10 times worse than it is now. Just fucking hanging. And I was like, holy shit. Damn. Immediately. Went, That's I went to the emergency room at E-Town and they uh, said I had Bell's palsy. And then I ended up getting like an MRI in my brain. And the dude told me I had like lesions on my brain or some shit. So that's kind of when I was like, well, I already had a few tryouts, you know, that didn't work out. I'm mid-30s. So 
maybe I'll give it a give it a rest. Man, that's that's a tough thing to, to cope with, huh? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great, but you know, I did it. You know, it was just payback. Um, you know, then you had the spot as the the uh, the champion at OBW, so you know, yeah. So it, was, it all came back around. I, I I tried to sabotage your career, and then you know, indirectly put me out with Bell's palsy. So it all came back to me, man. Yeah, life always comes back. Yeah. So so I I want to <laughs> give a plug to to the moose james thomas real quick okay because he wanted me to put him over all right so <laughs> he he was the first guy that i worked a program with after theta lambda side we were the last two gavin had gotten signed i think streetman had let just left lumpy disappeared so it was just the two of us and we did we did a little uh a little thing uh and he put me over or you know what i put him over i put him over more often than not yeah. But I had won a, I'd won a battle royal when he was out of town and he was a champion. So I, I'm probably the first guy to ever win the championship without getting the belt. So you oh, – wait a second. He was out of town. He was out of town. I won a 30-man battle royal. Threw the last guy over, celebrated. So there was no belt. So then we started our program after that based on the fact that I didn't have the belt. Wait, where was the belt? Well, it was with him in probably Minnesota or somewhere. But then how did you win the belt? Because he had to, like, forfeit the title? I don't get why he wasn't in the Battle Royal, but his belt was supposed to be. Like, the title was on the line? Yeah, he wasn't there. He wasn't available. So they, they wanted uh, – you know what? Bill Carr, for some reason, was allowed to make the call that he wanted to put the belt on me, and he wanted me to be the face <laughs> of OVW. So then they decided they had to do it right then and there, and they had that Battle Royal. So you won so the title we'll, and there was no title. It's like the DCW scholarship envelope almost. You should have brought that's right. There. Damn, I bet I still have that envelope. <laughs> Big Cat was the champ, man. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I, maybe I won that at some point. Oh, I bet you won that. Well, I saw Moose on Facebook because there's a new uh, Derby City Wrestling in Louisville. And I saw Moose say that he was the tag team champion and got the scholarship envelope were you, were you his tag team partner for that probably yeah i bet you were i bet you do have a scholarship envelope somewhere we we probably retired those yeah and then big cat is the champion champion because he beat me in the finals of the tournament so he was the scholarship champion and you guys were the scholarship tag champs yeah i, I believe we did retire those that's why we well, you might have, but I'm just saying that if you ever, you know, Derby City's coming back. If you ever thought about maybe getting back in the wrestling business, all you got to do is show up in Louisville, Kentucky. I think it, it it goes on this Sunday, actually. Show up with that envelope. Tell the dude that's in charge that you are the scholarship champion and you're cashing that damn thing in Sunday and you'll get right in that thing for free, man. Damn. All right. <laughs> said, all right. <laughs> I'll but, do that. Uh, Give us some Rip Rogers stories, man. Tell us about meeting Rip. What do you remember about Rip? Training with Rip, anything. Give us some on Rip here, man. All right. So the first day I showed up, um, I was sitting in, I was sitting on the bleachers, and practice was about to start. And, and Fang and Sonic were the first two in the building. And they came up to me with their hand. I, you know, I was green, obviously. And they came up to me with their hands out, and they treated me like I was somebody. And I was like, who do you think I am? And that's when I, I kind of quickly learned that you're supposed to show respect. And then and then Rip came in and I was nervous as hell. And I and I called you. I said, hey, Kip, how you doing? And you were saying yeah. something. And, and, and after a couple of seconds, it sank in and, and your whole look changed. And you said and you said, you know, you look like you look like that cocksucker, Eric Bischoff. Yeah, and I could. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you stopped somebody. You said, don't he look like that cocksucker Eric Bischoff? And you started yelling at me. <laughs> yeah, that was the worst possible introduction on my behalf. So did he know you called him the wrong name? Like, did Yeah, he that yeah I, it registered, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did, now, did you not know his name or did you just? No, know? I just I just misspoke. Just miss. <laughs> I've done that my whole life. Just misspoke. <laughs> oh. Just misspoke. So, so, so what happened after that? Anything like days later, weeks later, you guys? I, I believe you forgot who I was by the time I got through Joey's class, thankfully. Oh, yeah. That's, you know, and then I showed up as Allie G, so I bought myself plenty of uh, buffer time. 
between the combat time through joey's class then you painted the gimmick face and came out did the promos and we all know lit rip loves those cheesy ass promos in promo class and then you were back in baby huh yeah i used i used to rehearse that that that, those ali g promos all week long and i remember i got up one week and i was running through it and i was doing the, the the british accent and i lost my place and i just i just had to stop and then rip got up and you were you were talking about how over I was and it didn't matter what the fuck I said because I was uh, colorful and this and that or whatever. And you said, don't, it don't matter. And you had me start over and I started over and I, I hit the same spot again and I just went blank again and I couldn't finish the promo because I just had to rehearse everything. Uh, but I, I always appreciated the, the, the backing from Rip regardless of my quality. I was telling him, man, I told you, I was telling him before we got on here, how Rip always put you over and he loved you. And he, now he's kayfabe in the whole thing. No, I can't remember. That. He said, I can't remember nothing. <laughs> I <got> okay, <laughs> well, so I, I never had a move set, but one of the few things I ever started doing was I started doing the, the Dolph Ziggler slap your leg on the drop kick. Ooh. When I, when I was baby face, when me and Moose were working. And uh, so I came back and I had a big welt on the side of my leg. And Susio stopped you in the hallway, Rip, and and he said, and he pointed it out. He said, Rip, what do you think of that? <laughs> and you just looked at me, you smiled at me, you said, You're the man, beef. And you <laughs> man. Beefy Wellington, the only person that can do the leg slap and get away with it. Rip still puts it over, man. Man. He hey. must have really liked you. Well, years ago, only the English guys would slap. And they did it so good, you could be watching for it and you wouldn't see it. But today's guys, it's almost like a rib, ha ha. Yeah. Watch me football kick. Let me slap, let me make this as obvious. I'm slapping my fucking leg. It is all a fucking rib on the wrestling business. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Now, when you did it, do you think you did it? You think people noticed that you were doing it or you think you hit no, it? No, it was good. I just left evidence every time on your, yeah. On your leg. What was that? Lawler used to slap the other person. Right? He always slapped the other person. Lawler, yeah. yeah, Lawler used to slap the other person. <laughs> so you were getting no oh, fuck there. Like Lawler would be selling. He'd say, beat the shit out of me. I'd fucking hit him, but he'd slap me in the fucking side. I said, fuck you, <laughs> motherfucker. You're hurting me. <laughs> Good rib. Who else do you have any uh, feuds with in um, OVW or DCW? I worked with Jamin a lot. Oh, yeah. Jamin was... And he, he taught me more about character. He was awesome, man. I thought I thought Jamin was really good. Was Pops there, Ben Hameen there when you were there? Yeah. Did, yeah, the insurgency. Oh, yeah, with your character and stuff. I didn't I didn't I didn't work with them a whole lot. Because you guys uh, were heels and they were heels, but I didn't know like in promo class. I know he he was always trying to help people with gimmicks and promos and, and all that kind of stuff. No, nah, I don't remember, but we worked with the mobile homers for like a solid, a solid year, I think. Man Beast was in our uh, live chat today. Dr. Dr. Man Beast. Those guys were pretty good, huh? Yeah. God, his, uh, his ability to improvise. Lump, yeah, Lumpy, good. Lumpy, uh, he showed up with red boots and he got put in a battle royal and Man Beast was on commentary and he asked him what his name was, what he wanted to be called. And he said, ah. Uh, I don't know. And he said, all right. And he came out and he called him Lumpy Magoo on the fly. Did he really? That's how that started? <laughs> That's how, that, that was the creation of one of the most over characters in the history. Yeah. The Derby City Wrestling. And left. Yeah, Beast. I remember Be- well, we, we just had it on here. So my brother wrestled one match at his school. <clears throat> and um, my brother's like. Six foot 12. Yeah, six foot 12 is what we say. <laughs> Big guy and uh, never wrestled, never been in a ring for it in his life. We wrestled against uh, Power and Man Beast. And Beast had him in there doing all these, just had him stand in the middle of the ring, did it like a tackle, went down. Then got like a football stance, running tackle, went down. Got up on the second buckle, had my brother step over to the flying shoulder tackle, went down. Power comes in, tackle goes. I mean, it's just my brother never moved a muscle. And they took like four <laughs> bumps, and the place was just going nuts. I mean, it was it was awesome, man. It was, it was really helpful having those guys specifically around. And they'd, they'd work hour tags in, in practice. Rip would have them go an hour. You'd have them, you'd have them run through uh, 
30, 30 pins, 30 different pins without stopping mm -hmm. and, and shit like that. But by the time I got to FCW and they'd have us do like five pins in a row, it was pretty easy by that point. <laughs> Overprepared, baby. Did you ever get the uh, ding? Did you ever get kicked out of the ring by Rip? I mean, you, you sounds like you were his boy, so I highly doubt that you ever got kicked out of the ring. But did you ever get the ding, get the fuck out of the ring? No, I don't, I, I don't recall. I unless know. I was a part of a team. I, I remember I was part of a, I was part of a probably an eight man that had uh uh who are the who are the colorful characters at the time? Who was let's get crazy? Uh Richard Cranium. Richard Cranium, Cranium. yeah. Now didn't Richard Specs. Cranium didn't Richard Cranium get out of the country and move to get some woman from some other country or something like that? I have no idea. Cranium, I have no idea. Dre Blitz, Specs. I don't know. Yeah, pro probably all of them. And I do remember you stopped that match, and <laughs> but you you pointed out that if if you bring enthusiasm to the table, you can cover a lot of shit with enthusiasm. And that was the big message that I took that day. You stopped it, but you 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 put them over for being shit because they were so enthusiastic about what they were doing. Ass ass in, man. We had a we had a great crew. So you, you were there when we. You were there. I mean, we have some of those practices where we had like 50 guys at practice. I mean, were you there at that time? The, yeah, I remember the first time that I watched the practice. And it, I, I guess you, have, you probably had a whistle. And, and uh, practice started, and everyone would just start clapping in unison. And they'd just go right into a line. I thought, what the fuck is this? I just yeah. joined the Army. <laughs> and everyone knew exactly what they were doing, and it was crisp. Um, yeah, we started around the road. We did crisscross first. We always did – we did the crisscross and we do like the, uh, the blow up drill or whatever. And yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I, I know everyone puts over your training, obviously you don't need to repeat all that, but I always, I appreciated the combination of structure, but then the creative freedom that you gave us, like when we chain wrestle for an hour, I remember being a little bit nervous about that, but then you just do it so long that you just drop into it. And that's how I learned to sell creatively because I just started having fun with it because you weren't going anywhere for a little while. You had yeah. to do that for an hour. So you had to give in at some point. And I always, strangely, I liked the train, the, the chain wrestling for an hour it was my favorite part because you just get to, to have fun and explore and, and let, let, let go. And find some on your there. wrestling cardio without going out in the parking lot and doing a thousand squats, you know, like, yeah. yeah well, you wear shit that you can sell for, five dollars it cost you 30 cents yeah i mean yeah that's that's true he was, I think he was another one that, that at one point in time came out with all the stuff and then maybe was eliminated because he had the glass he had like the boa at one time i think the glasses he had all the stuff that he would undress and then get there. maybe not get eliminated but then lose a match in about 20 seconds you know just get get the shit beat out of him yeah, yeah he'd buy a pack of those glasses for at the dollar store and he'd sell them for a couple bucks each yeah, he was making good money. I like the uh, um, the remember the grape drink uh, drink connection. Uh, were, yeah. you, were you there them? They they sold the uh, the gallon was, of was that um, Debo Debo and uh, you got to get in here, Rip Debo and um, the Army of Two Triple R one. No, 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 Triple R Rough Rider Rashawn. Oh yeah, yeah. They sold the the grape drink. I remember uh, we turned. I um, didn't know they sold it. Yeah, they, when we do the, when we would go to the uh, weekend shows, the spot shows, they would take it, but then they turn like heel or whatever. So me and Apoc had turned babyface. So we went and stole so we could make money. We stole their gallons of grape drink. So then at intermission, we sold their stuff, and then we split we split the money. <laughs> so that's how we got got through through that. That was awesome, man. Yeah, we just took a gallon of it in the paper cups and then sell it to the crowd at, at intermission. They should have sat out front with a little like a lemonade stand. Oh yeah, it still awesome. coming in the doors. <laughs> that that would have been great. So take us to get inside, man. We really haven't talked about that at all. What? How did how did that come into play? Was it a try? That was a tryout camp, wasn't it? Or no? Uh, yeah, they had a paid camp that you could go down to Florida for. He was in. Florida. I, okay, I, I, I went to that with Brewski. I, I uh, we stayed in the. Oh, Brewski, huh? Place to go. Yeah. This is another blast from the past, oh, man. I got Steve a Brewski. Brewski were roommates at the uh, trial camp, huh? Yeah, and I remember he got he got asked, obviously, if he was on the gas. 
And <laughs> oh, did he really? He said, he, yeah, he said, no, I'm not. Uh, he said, don't fucking believe me. I said, no, don't. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, but so we, we paid, I don't know what we paid to that. I, I remember uh, a lot of the boys didn't want to pay. They felt like it was a work, but I, I don't know. I felt like you got you to gotta go to where they are. That's why I went to Louisville. Yeah. So I paid for it, and then and then I was on their radar. So I was an extra, uh, a handful of times. That's when uh, Laurenitis kayfabe me, and that was, damn, that was so embarrassing. Just sitting there, and I could because after about thirty minutes, I couldn't get up because I I come there to talk to him, but he was just sitting in his office, and uh, Taker was changing in his office at that point. So I was just kind of like sitting outside the hallway and Ace would come out of his office and not look at me and Taker was sitting in there kind of slowly changing. And I was just sitting there like, what the fuck do I do now? Do I just get up or do I go in there and bother him again? Because he told me to wait a minute. And uh, after like 45 minutes or an hour, Toronto came over and said, oh, why, don't you come, why don't you come back later? And he, he escorted me out to my relief. I got to tell you, man, I think what, what number of, of show was this that you were an extra? Was this your first time being an extra, your fifth time being an extra? I think it's a ballsy move as an extra just to go meet with somebody. Like I, maybe, I, like I said earlier, maybe I should have tried it. I never would have even thought about trying to get a meeting like that. Yeah. I, I've always been able to embarrass myself to painful degrees, degrees <laughs> to get to get where I want to go. Uh, Joey told me to go see Brawler and cut a promo for him. And I couldn't, I, I could never cut a promo at any point in time during my stay at OVW. So that's when I got a, I got a little camera and I just set it up, uh, during the day when I was at home in between training clients and I just start cutting a promo and I cut it over and over and over and over again. Uh, and, um, and I cut, I eventually cut a promo for Brawler, and he said that it was one of the top three promos that he'd ever heard in that room, and he put it up there with, with some pretty big names like Mr. Mr. Anderson and a couple other guys. So he, he said that he was going to get me a job, and he went and told Laurinaitis, and Laurinaitis didn't like that he was taking, taking extras into that promo room and, wow. and having him do that shit. He didn't like that at all. Uh, but he, I got an, uh, a meeting with – with Laurinaitis and and he said oh, uh brawler said you cut one hell of a promo why don't, you, why don't you cut that for me and uh him and Ty Bailey were in the room and I was I was pretty damn nervous I was, uh just just where do you where do you want me to look or right now you gotta stop me for to... one second was this the same day that you were waiting on him outside the office was this all the same day no this this okay, is okay. probably like uh this is probably like six months later I, okay all enough right. enough time I, I embarrassed myself with the boss and then I I do a gimmick. I I allow them to forget who I am. Gotcha. I put on the makeup. I be Ali G, and then they forget. And then and then I can come back and try again. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, man. I just had to know if it was that same. Yeah. Yes. No. It, it it actually took a couple of times. He told me to go to Brawler and cut a promo, and I I asked Brawler if I cut a promo. He said, "All right, but this needs has got to be. It's got to fucking. You got to knock this out of the park. You got to blow me away. If you want to do it right now, we can do it right now. Or you can come back next time. You can prepare." I said, "All, all right, I'll I'll come back next time." So then, like three months later, I I just practiced for for three months cutting promos, and uh and came back and and he gave me that feedback. So, um, so, so Johnny Ace wasn't happy really that you were an extra in the promo room, but then you you did it. So so he so he had me cut the promo again in his office, and I was pretty nervous, and I, I don't know that I nailed it like I did the first time, probably, but he kind of he faved me pretty good, and he said it was all right, and then he gave me some pointers and. And he sent me home. And, and it was that day that he signed Asher Knight. I don't know if you remember Asher. I remember that name. Yeah. Was he, he wasn't, he wasn't, OVW. he wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't there long. I think it was OVW. He wasn't, he wasn't around for very long. I know he the was, name, but I can't remember. He was very green. Um, but I, I think he probably had a much better interview than me. Cause he, he I mean, I, I felt like he couldn't, offer anything else that I could offer. So I was pretty, I was pretty pissed off about that. Uh, but then I just went back to work and, and forgot about it because they weren't going to be back in town for another six months. So, uh, uh, so then one day out of the blue, like five months later, Ty Bailey calls me up and he says, you know, we were thinking about that promo that you cut in, in Johnny's office that one day. And, 
<laughs> and I was thinking, you 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 were just thinking about that promo I cut six months ago. All right. Sure. And he uh, he yeah he offered me a contract over the phone and holy shit. I was able to kayfabe a little bit, and he asked me if I was excited, and I said, yeah. And uh, he gave me, like, $2,000 to move, so I moved to, moved to Tampa. That's when I was putting on weight. So my last I, – I, I'd stopped working for a little while, and my last match at OVW was Mondo and Moose and me in, in a triple threat. And I put on, like, 25 pounds just trying to, just trying to add weight because I was slimming down. Yeah. Brewski said I looked like a tennis player at one point. <laughs> So uh, that got me motivated. So I started putting on weight. And in, in my my last match, I jumped off the top buckle and I landed and like wrenched my knee a little bit. So uh, so I didn't work again after that for a while. But then I moved moved to Tampa. And... So when they when they actually called you to offer you, were you were you not wrestling at OVW then at that time? Was that after you had jumped off the top rope or whatever? No. no okay. So I yeah, I was working regularly. Okay. He called me up. I, I told Danny and then uh, I just kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I had like three months, so I didn't work much in between them, but then I had to give up the belt. Uh, I forget who to probably Mondo maybe, um, but I'd, I'd taken a little break for whatever reason. Yeah. So the, the day you were waiting, I don't know if you answered this or, or, not answered it, but said this, and I wasn't listening. The day you were waiting outside Laurinaitis' office the first time, did he ever then let you in that day when you said you were sitting there for like an hour? N- n- no, I I never got in. Corrado got in. escorted me out. I I, I didn't. I, I may have tried to follow up just in the back somewhere, and he kind of just shooed me away. But, um, I mean, that was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life which is saying something because I've got plenty, but uh, that, that one's tough. That was hard to live down. I, I, just, I didn't know what I was going to do from there. Just let time heal those wounds. I think. I but like take her, nobody said anything to you. No. Yeah. yeah. Then you were fine. If none of those no. guys said anything, you were fine. So you got to think- be jacked about that. Right. I mean, you've done all this. You try to get in the door, try to get in the door. And then out of the blue, five months later, they call you with the contract. I mean, you said you tried to kayfabe it a little bit, but man, you had to be kind of jacked for that, didn't you? Yeah, it was exciting. It was, you know, I mean, it was just out of the blue. So it was a little bit surreal, I guess. A little bit surreal. They, they come to OVW at, at one point and Ace had come and I'd, I'd cut a promo just like everybody else there, but it, it wasn't any good. But that was, that was a while back. Yeah, I was at that. I was at, I think I was at that one, the one where they signed. We just had Chris Cage on here. They had signed Cage out of that and Ryback and, I think Professor got signed out of out of that one. Yeah, if it's the one you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. Abraham Washington, he he got signed out of that one. Oh, I didn't like that because he didn't he didn't he left and just come back and they signed him. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, that was, and I said that's we could hear right I said no, they should have took your fucking name and in the next one fucking sign your ass, but make you go to fucking class and get better because he he was fucking rusty. You know what I mean? He could he could talk that shit, but all them other guys been busting their balls for how long? Then they fucking chose him. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even know him. He wasn't around at all. No, he showed. So he he was like I think they were called the um, neighborhoodies or something. Basically, it was him and and JTG. JTG yeah, were JT were Crime Time before Crime Time. Uh-huh. Basically, so yeah, that's and then he left. And then, um, you know, he just showed up, man. Like he just showed up for that tryout. I don't even know how he knew about it. <clears throat> but uh, see, so with the FCW, then who was the who was the head head honcho there, the trainer when you when you got to FCW? Because it wasn't really like NXT now, right? I mean, it was more. No, like it was FCW, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a little bit like the Wild West, and uh, it, it was Doctor Tom. He was he was running the show, and he was a cool guy. He'd let us he'd let us explore a little bit and do some carny shit or whatever we could come up with. And we, we had, we have a lot of fun with him. And I was actually, I watched his, uh, him back when he was on the podcast and he was telling the story about going an hour with APOC. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it was. Yeah. APOC. Yeah, yeah. I sat there for that. Did uh, you really? He, he went up la- last minute. He went up to the, the top turnbuckle and he moonsaulted. I don't, I don't know how old he is or how old he was. 
but he, I mean, I don't think he was in shape. And uh, I heard him say that he had never done that before. I mean, Pac moved, but. Uh, he said he got up there and then he had to do it. Like he, once he went up there, he's like, he said something like, I knew I had to, I had to go for it after that. Yeah. Yeah. Man, listen, listen to this, Rip. He watches, he, he come in and watches some of our show. How about that shit? Thanks, man. Somebody's got, yeah. Somebody got to watch it. So might as well be him. Yeah. Well, look, now that you're cutting down on the cursing, I think your numbers are going to. Are you going to take oh, off? No. <laughs> when I stopped, when I stopped cussing, we fucking crashed. When I was cussing, I think, fine, that's better. Are you, are you anti-cussing? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? No, I, I actually, I think that Rip could possibly be the person to move us back, move this pendulum back toward from critical, uh, political correctness back towards just being like a real human being again. I think that you could start that movement. Yeah. We're, we're, I think we're like, we're out here. We're about to swing back. See, if you guys will just hang in there, you're going to lead this movement back towards like <laughs> being humans again. That's, that's my belief. And I'm glad you guys are doing this because I think the world needs more for Rogers. That's awesome, man. You heard it here first. It's like breaking news. Rip is leading the, leading the way back to Humanity, basically, back to the way it used to be. Yeah, I'm just like a, everybody's yeah. gonna follow along. That'd be great. I love it, man. Hey, I, I I lived in California for for five years. It's a little that, bit wild out there. It's a little bit crazy. I thought that was, uh, but in some of California, it's kind of the other way, though. And it, and it, it come, like offended a lot, though. I thought no. Oh wrong? yeah, 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 yeah. Very very offensive. Very <clears throat> offended. Um, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's a strange world. I, can I ask one quick question? You can ask uh, all the questions you yeah, want, man. I, I want to call Rip a monolith again while you're recording and, and an idol and a Catholic priest. Uh, so I was watching. I forget what show it was when you were talking about your son for a minute. Uh-huh. And for someone like me who, who uh, sees you in a certain light, it's like hearing a backstory on like Santa Claus or something. And hearing that you have a 25 year old son who's a a genius who's going to grad school in California. I was, my mind was a little bit blown on that. Where, where does he, where does he live? And what is, what does he study? Well, he lives in San Francisco, the most expensive city in the goddamn world. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, he's like six, two, half six, him about, he's about six, two or six, three, whatever the hell. So when he was born, I looked at that son of a bitch and I said, well, I was accusing, you know, Whoever it was, I said, no, no, he's mine. I looked just like that when I was a kid. So what the fuck, right? <laughs> yeah, I never met him. I knew, I knew of him, but I don't think I ever met him. What, what, is, what does he study? Acting. Voice. Oh. Theater. And Okay. He's got a, he's got a radio voice out the motherfucking ass. Great boy. Yeah. 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 And, That's awesome. Well, I mean, if there's one place that's worse to live in than L.A., it's 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 got to be San Francisco. Well, oh, why, yeah. why is he? At, why is he in San Francisco? <laughs> He's at the Academy of the Arts, whatever it's called. Uh, huh. Oh no, I was there, and fuck every, every hustler there is trying to fucking take your fucking money. They got their beds on the fucking sidewalk. You can't walk out without ninety-two guys trying to take your fucking money, lure you to this, start a fight with this or that. Holy, what a shithole that is. This could be it is a shit. You, you, if you drive your car in there, you'll get it broken into within five minutes. Yeah, they got some law out there too. Like, there's no law, right? You can can't you like do that shit, get away with it? Yeah, I, I had my car. I, I went up there. My dad came over. We went up to San Francisco for a little vacation, and we got there. We parked outside the Giant Stadium. We walked around the stadium, got back to the car had been broken into. We called the cops. They said, "What do you want us to do about it? File a report." And that was it. So everyone knows that you just do whatever you want, and there, there's no consequences out there. Pretty it's much, pretty yeah. Wild. That's why I don't. That's why I don't live there. I mean, you know, kind of kidding. Me. So how how did you end up getting a WWE man? Like, what was the call up on that? I mean, I don't. I don't remember. All I remember you is like showing up and being the face of freaking WWE. How did? How the hell did that happen? Man, that's kind. I mean, you, and he's you were all over the place, dude. I couldn't believe it. Like, you were everywhere. I was like, this motherfucker is like, well, I mean, Bischoff. That's funny because you said he said you look like Bischoff. Yeah. 
then you're on there with Bishop, you're on there with Triple H, you're on there with Stephanie, you're on there with all the top stars, man. Like you were, you couldn't turn that show on without without seeing you. I did have a good run, did I? Yeah. I, I, see, I didn't appreciate any of it, man. Not not a bit of it. I wanted to I wanted to work. Yeah. Yeah. But they brought me up. That they needed. Cena was supposed to work CM Punk, but Cena got hurt, so they had to throw Ryback in the title picture at Hell in a Cell that that one year. And Ryback wasn't ready, but they didn't want him to lose, so they brought me up in that referee gimmick. Oh, that's so right. That I could, so ready. that I could heal on on Ryback. I forgot about that. Yeah. So then I so I had to be a referee for my first three months up there, and and I just I, I didn't really embrace it. I, I was one of those stories where they just kind of lost their way a little bit. I got I got caught up in some things. I mean, I'm sure you know the news. It's fairly <laughs> old at this point, right? I mean, I I mean, I I'm assuming I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. some some stuff leaked, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, I- it was it was kind of that that time period when I got so I, I had a porn addiction, and then that cascaded into a sex addiction. And that was a whole, a whole thing for me that was just very mind, mind consuming. So I wasn't very focused at, at right at the time when I should have been. And then I'm going up there as a referee, and I'm having to carry a, a walkie-talkie around, and my my ego was just fucking too big, and it didn't didn't fully take advantage of opportunities. I don't think. Well, it's, it, it it wasn't your fault. Right, the way the wrestling business was. Before you, they had the territories. You go there and learn your craft for five to ten years. Then you would bend over all the the other shit. Now you're ready to fucking make fucking money, and you're really good in the ring. They're not hiring guys off the street or who's or from uh, uh, OVW wrestling school or whatever. No, they they were they were five to ten year veterans of of three hundred matches a year. You could work babyface. You could work heel. You could be any fucking character. You were so overqualified for the job when there was a territories because there was a there was eight hundred wrestlers in the states working full time every fucking night. Then all of a sudden you yeah. go there and you hadn't been on the road. That's why I was throwing so much shit at you guys of how to because they're going to look at you guys. You guys are young and you got potential. And you know your basics. Now we can, if they do all that and they're in shape, they're obviously got a good attitude. And then hopefully uh, you can learn because I was just throwing shit against the goddamn wall, trying to make you guys uh, realistically, you didn't have a chance. So I can throw all this shit at you so you can be overqualified for certain things. And when you get up there, you'll get some confidence going, God damn, I'm better than these fucking stars. And a yeah. lot of the guys that, that had been in, been down there for years, they were better than the fucking stars. But they got heat on themselves because the stars knew it, and they get mad at them because they were better than them. Such, uh, is, life, such is life. It's catch-22 no matter what. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really wish that you'd taught us a few more moves, Rip, because I didn't, I, I didn't have a move set. You well, being I, serious? Worked, you're being serious. <laughs> Are you being serious? <laughs> yeah. No, I would uh, – when, when I would get on house shows on, on the full loop, uh, whoever I was working, I was always heel. They, and they'd tell me about all their moves that they were going to do in their sequences. And then they'd ask me, what moves do you want to get in? And I would always say, uh, I, I don't have any, I don't have any moves. Uh, <laughs> we'll do whatever. And yeah. and they would either, they would either look at me like I had two heads or, or like I was a complete fucking jobber. <laughs> But I, I, I never, I never developed a move set ever. I never taught moves. <clears throat> it's about working, not moves. Yeah. yeah today I mean, I know you guys, you guys talk about this all the time, but I'm more interested in, in character right. shit, anyways. So that that's what it kind of intrigued me about. You became this character, like you were the the like the raw GM, and you know, you said a little bit ago, you know, promos, you were you were rehearsing, you were rehearsing, and. I think you might have even said you were, you know, a little uncomfortable one time doing promos. But th- then, what's it like going and being like the promo guy, like GM or Raw and stuff? And I know you said you didn't really embrace being the referee, but how about transitioning to the next part where you're speaking all the time and the camera's right on you? Were you nervous at all? Did you like that? Did you embrace that? How how was that for you? 
I, I didn't like it as much as I should have. I mean, it was it was a huge opportunity. I, I hear you, Rip, talk about being grateful for every day and every moment and all that shit. But that is that is such a mindset thing that if you don't have that, there's no amount of goods that's going to make you happy. So when I got that gimmick, I, I mean, I was it was cool, but I, I still wanted to work and I was still not really embracing it, I don't think. And I don't think it was nearly my best promo work, but uh, – I did. Uh, I did get to stay up because after I did the the gimmick with Ryback and Punk, they had me go out and cut a promo. Vince had no idea who I was uh, or anything about me, and that was in Manchester. And so I, they just had me cut a promo, and I was I was pretty nervous, but luckily that that played into who that character was supposed to be as, as an amateur dream chaser. So. I, I, I hit I hit that one well enough that Vince wanted he decided right then I guess that he wanted to keep me up and and do more with me so that that bought me time and probably eventually that that GM role. So after the uh, the the screw job or whatever when you were being the referee, is that when you cut the promo? Or did you ref more after that? I can't remember. Where, you didn't just become the GM then right after that. What happened right after that match? Uh, well, so Vince offered me the million dollar contract. And and that and so then I wrestled Ryback the following week. He just beat the shit out of me, <laughs> threw me in an ambulance, <laughs> and, and and I didn't come back for two weeks. I was I was healing up for two weeks, and then they did this little shtick where I was I was getting another shot at it, and then Great Kali comes out, and oh, I get another shot at it, and Sheamus comes out. And I get another I don't shot remember at any it. of that. I, that all happened. Yeah that that was uh that was like in November December that year and uh. Before the great Kal- Kali match, I uh, I sang my promo. I sang a Christmas song about Brad Maddox on my way to the ring, and then and then he beat the shit out of me and and chopped me in, in the head and all that stuff. So I got beat up for I got beat up for like a, a good two months, and then they uh, they put me with Vicky, which was pretty damn cool. Oh yeah, that's right. Yep. Wow. What was the what was Kali like, man? I. I know Nick has told a couple of stories on Kali. Was was your match all right with him? He didn't he didn't kill you, huh? No, nah, he didn't. I mean, I, I think the chop did hurt <laughs> yeah. in the head. Uh, it was. I mean, there wasn't too much. It was like he had to give me two things, and I'm yeah. sure those were painful, but it wasn't it wasn't too bad. I drove him around for a little while there, which was which was nice because they wouldn't give me shit trying to get into the building. Because usually I'd show up and they they tell me this was for wrestlers only, <laughs> and so I, you know, I was just I was just hot. I'm a wrestler motherfucker. Wow! So man. when he was when he was in the car, I didn't have to explain my existence. So after you said you, you said you thought Vince liked that promo, so he kept you around, wanted to keep you up. Did he actually talk to you then and, and tell you some of this stuff going into the GM role, or did you still not really talk to Vince at that time? I was I didn't talk to Vince enough when I first got there. Yeah. I uh, I did not capitalize on that situation uh, until I got sent home for like six months at one point because I was probably too much of a, a distraction in the locker room. Uh, but when I got back, they they went. I was living in Charlotte, and they came to Atlanta, so I drove the three hours to Atlanta, and I and I I went into his office and I asked him to either put me back on the road or release me. And so he put me back on the road and that's when I started knocking on Vince's door every week or almost every week and going in and talking to him and discovering that if I, if I brought ideas to him and, and made that effort that, that he really liked to, to talk shop. And so I did start to get over, but I was too late. I'd, I'd missed the window really. And then, um, when when they when they sent you home or whatever was that in the middle of being the GM or had you been written off the GM like did one cause the other or were you in the middle of it and they sent you? I, I'd already been I'd already been fired as GM for I a did. while because they they said they wanted to let me work but there was no there was no real plan so I was just kind of sitting around backstage every week wondering you know which is a, a real insecure position to be in. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's real, it's real easy to be, uh, everyone's working hard and everyone's working together. And it's a, it's a tight unit of a locker room like we had at OVW and, and everyone's working towards 
creating something and there's there's no politics going on and it's just hard work and it's easy to 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 find that flow but i think that by the time i got to that stage where i was i was just trying to find something to hang on that it's uh, it's a tough position to be in and then i'm i'm trying to get the writers to pay me attention so i can pitch them an idea and then i'm starting to feel like a nuisance and i don't know it all gets it all gets really tough up there if you're not locked in yeah, I mean, um, I mean, Tank just said the same thing last night, and pretty much everybody that comes on here from OBW, you know, says OBW was like a family, and it was, you know, basically the best time of my life, and you didn't have to worry so much. I mean, there was some little shit here and there in OBW, but nothing like, you know, going up to WWE, and it's the same thing, man. Pretty much everybody that comes on this show says, you know, that exact same thing, and it it's unfortunate, I think. Like, I think it kind of sucks that you finally reach your dream. I was never there. And then all of a sudden it's not as either fun or fulfilling or, or whatever. Maybe what you thought it would be is kind of the perception I have. I just think that yeah. kind of sucks, man. Like to hear people say that. Uh, yeah, it, it goes, it gets tougher, but I think, I don't know. I, I think it maybe just weeds out those who are not as committed as, as others. I know some people just don't work out, but I don't know. I, I try to believe that the cream always rises to the top at some point. Yeah. So um, you said Vince, uh, you know, put you back on the road or whatever, and you were going to creative and going to him and trying to find stuff. And what is something at the end though? Did, was it something at a house show? Is that why you ultimately got released? Did you, when that you said something to somebody or said something to the crowd? Was that. Oh, so I was just getting in with, with Vince. I mean, I've been talking to him for a while, trying to find gimmicks. And then me and Adam Rose were about to do a tag team. We'd gone to see him that day. Uh, and he had signed off on it. So we were going to start a little gimmick. And, and then I had a singles dark match before the show. And, and I cut a promo uh, on my way out to the ring. And I, I called the, the Indianapolis crowd. I called them cocky pricks at the end of my promo. That's our and, uh, and he, 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 he kicked me out of the building. Vince did? After that one. Yeah. Hmm. And it was a house show, like a. It was a dark match before a Raw. Oh, dark match before Raw. Or it was it was before SmackDown because Vince never watches shit before SmackDown starts. So it was weird that he was even watching, but he saw that and, and sent me home. And then the next day, Carano called me and told me, "Cocky pricks." Is that? I mean, I don't know. Is that that bad? Really? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something on that. That well, doesn't seem yeah, like you're working for that company. They should have the words that you, they don't want you to say on TV or a house show. Then you don't ever have to, if if it's laid out in front of you, these are the rules, you memorize them, and you're, there's no, you know, you know you're not supposed to say that, and you won't. Damn. It's not that yeah. hard. Yeah, but I'm just saying in general, whether they have a post or not, it just doesn't seem like, to me, it was that bad. I don't know. Anybody yeah, said uh, anything else to you one way or the other? Like anybody ever, I mean, did you ever get a feel? Was it they were just looking to get rid of you at that time? Or do you do you feel cocky pricks was was like that bad and that big a mistake that you made? It's a great mystery. I don't know. Maybe Vince was having one of his days. Yeah. Or I, I, I'm sure I had enough heat that it was good enough cause. I know that Vince liked me, but I'm sure plenty of people didn't. So it, it might have been a combination of things. What was it like coming back after six months? Did you, I mean, did you have heat then? Like you just said, like with the, the boys and shit in the back or what was it? Was it weird coming back after six months or you just come back and everything's I, kind of back? to well, I got, I got hungry again. Yeah. Waiting, waiting that long, trying to come up with ideas. Uh, no longer afraid to go knock on Vince's door. Like I had been, you know, you sit at home long enough. You get to think about things. Uh, but I may have overcorrected. I don't know. I'm, I may have bugged people too much. I may have bugged the writers too much. I don't know. May have, may have been too aggressive. Yeah. I don't know. So we got about five minutes left here, six minutes left here. What? Um, and again, I can go back and edit this, not edit this. What? Do you, what? What about nowadays? Any anything after wrestling you want to share? Anything you're doing now? Want to plug now? Tell the people now that you're, um, you know out doing this promo. I mean, you know how many people are going to see this? I mean, we have at least 200, 300 people that watch these videos. I mean, it's pretty much worldwide, nationwide. Everybody's going to see it. Anything you want to put out there, plug, yeah. push, anything. 
Yeah, you got like, over a thousand subscribers, right? Yeah, we got twenty, uh, about twenty three hundred, I think. So got there. got ripped drunk for the first time since I was born. Oh yeah, baby. Yeah. Got no, I don't. <laughs> I don't have anything to plug, really. Uh, I was I was trying to do some acting in L.A. I, I mean, I still am. I have an agent, and I I wrote a book that we're trying to get published, but that's not out yet. And and then I'm I, I I I work on writing. I'm trying to cobble together some screenplays, but I don't. I stay off of the grid for the most part. I'm just happy to be here and talk to you guys. <laughs> yeah, you were you were kind of miss, MIA there for a while, man. MIA, missing in. It's, a, it's, I remember it's seeing hard, some hard video on YouTube of of you in like a in a cave or some shit. I don't even know what it was. And I think that's you know, the last time I think I've I've seen you. I believe <laughs> that's that. I did that when I was sitting at home for six <laughs> months, and I was trying to come up with a storyline that I was going crazy. That was part of a, a gimmick that I was doing for the dot com, but then they didn't ever back me up on it. They kind of uh, didn't use it, and then people thought it was. For, oh, because people know, said like, you did it like after I think, and like, like after you got yeah. released, and you were yeah. I did a gimmick that I've been. I got. I was going on vacation. And I get. I got trapped in a cave in Venezuela or some shit in Mexico or somewhere. <laughs> and enough that 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 video where I went, uh, it got over a hundred thousand views and I, I i'd started that channel from scratch just my little vacation blog yeah. it was a pretty fucking good gimmick and they didn't use it but yeah, didn't you reverse your name or something on there like uh mad braddocks or that was gonna be my indie name but i i didn't pursue that at all did you ever wrestle after wwe i had about two matches did you i had one with uh with briley or, or uh yep. nemeth and and uh Luchasaurus and uh, Luchasaurus, Seth, Sky, Seth Skyfire was out there, and mm-hmm. Bronson, James Bronson at, at NXT. We had we had one match out in California, but that was about it. Yeah, Bradley. Well, we we were tag champs at one point in uh, FCW, as, as were me and um, Rick Victor. By the way, I wanted to. Oh, that's say that. shit. Oh, fuck, yeah. man. fuck. We you, taking a jab at me there, huh? Okay. That's I wanted cool. to get my shit in before I left. That's cool, so, huh? Hey, how many times did I tell you I said OVW would be the best time of your life? Which was? Cause, and then you look back because there was no stress. Nobody had any money. You just had the guys. Yeah. You went up there and now you're under the microscope, but you're making money, but you're, you're, you're walking on eggshells. You can be hired for no reason and fired for no reason. And you got other people, everybody loves you until you start doing better than them. They're going to stick a knife in your back. And you think the guy's your buddy and he's not. And and you think the guy's your enemy, but he's really supporting and you don't even know because everybody's so paranoid. Yeah. So you don't really get to embrace the moment or enjoy the moment, which I knew that ahead of time. That's why I'd always say you're going to look back and see that this was the, uh, the greatest time of your fucking life. Yeah, why didn't you ever get us to listen to you? Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, I would not have listened if I was in your shoes either, but I felt better uh, yeah. knowing if I told you that shit. Instead, he listened to all your sex stories, Rip. Well, I, <laughs> I, I learned from Rip in every facet. Yeah, see? It's not only my fault for the uh, whatever incident we had. It's your fault, too. So we're both to blame. Oh, I'm guilty of everything. At the wrestling with I'm Rip guilty Rogers of everything. Show. You know that. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> yeah, just think if you would have been on like national TV. Well, you're on national TV, but the internet, I should say, Rip. Oh who, my who God. Knows, I mean, had phones and stuff. Who knows what would happen to your career? Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, well, thank thank you guys for having me on. I I appreciate uh, aside from the 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 coaching that you gave us, just being in that little corner of of our universe and getting to just create shit and. And new characters and creating life that 50 fans got to witness and affect their lives and doesn't really matter the size of it does it just got to create and be free and I, I, yeah I miss those times greatly it's it's good to recall some of them yeah man thank you for coming on we got 20 seconds I liked everything about this interview about except for you and APOC being the attack uh, champs in FCW uh, <laughs> everything else was great besides that this thing's getting ready to cut off. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Nice chatting with you. It was awesome today, buddy. Yeah, man.
Thank you, guys. Thanks. Have a good one, baby. I'll see you.